very excited to celebrate our Centennial Ranches of Johnson County, part three. You're gonna be hearing Taylor Cove first from the Four Mile Ranch, and then you're gonna hear from Nancy Lee Beatty and Tammy Miller from the Mike A. Hackert Ranch. And then you'll hear from Travis Hackert at the end from the Richard and Donna Hackert Ranch. Uh, I wanna give a big thanks out for all the people who are attending this evening. This is our first virtual format, so I hope it goes well. I really wanna thank all of you supporting this program. Um, as you are aware, it was a pay what you want scale. We know funds are tight during COVID and uh, we were blessed to have a sponsor for us. So I'd like to give a big thank, big thank you out, not only to all of you who have made donations for this, but uh, Western Ranches, Bighorn Real Estate Associates, Christie's International Real Estate, and Julian Smith Real Estate here in town. We're so thankful that they thought this was a worthy program and is uh, the major sponsor for this. So I'm going to invite Travis to turn on his camera now and unmute. Yep. All right, now we got it figured out. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to introduce Travis Hackert to our conference, and I'm going to mute myself and so that Travis has the floor. As Jennifer said, I'm Travis Hackert. Um, I'm a fifth generation rancher here. I, I didn't do a presentation to have pictures, and I should have um, time didn't really allow that, so I'm just gonna gonna tell you the deal the way I know it. Um, and you know, part of the deal is I live in the house that my great granddad George Hacker built in the 20s. It wasn't his original homestead, um, but after they got things rolling a little bit, then he built it in the 20s. Uh, my grandpa and, and his brother helped him build it as kids, and uh, I live in that house, so that's a pretty proud thing for me. Um, obviously, it's been modernized. Uh, kind of, the, kind of to start the whole deal. Um, and this, and this, a lot of this is going to be kind of a redundant from what Nancy Lee said, and, and so everybody knows Nancy Lee Beatty is my godmother. Um, so there'll be a lot of redundant things. Um, her dad and my great granddad were were brothers, and, and they all kind of homesteaded here together. But Joseph Hackert, who is our my grandpa's grandpa come here and uh, or come to America in 1879 from Austria and he settled in New Ulm, Minnesota and uh, about seven or eight years later he married his wife Francisca and then he ended up farming in in Hinckley, Minnesota, and, and at one point, um, you know, they were there for some years. They were they were farming 1,200 acres a week, you know, with with horses and and uh, the old fashioned way. And he had 12 kids, um, and Nancy Lee's dad, Mike, and my great grandpa were were fairly close in age. My great grandpa was the third eldest out of 12. And um, so at the end of the day, you know, my grandpa was older than his youngest aunt, um, which was Mary. But in uh, 1916, I guess 1911, uh, the oldest daughter of Francis decided she wanted to come west and homestead, and uh, Joseph Hacker encouraged her to do it. And she went to Lavina, Montana, and homesteaded. And uh, you know she had a half a section of land, and 
was doing the way she could. When she came, she rode the train back for a, for a Christmas deal. And uh, she ran into an old schoolmate of her, Ben Lepink, and they ended up getting married and he went back to Minnesota with her, or to, I'm sorry, Montana with her. And uh, they were there for a few years. And then one of, uh, I believe it was John Hacker, one of the brothers come out there to visit and they caught with that there was homestead land in Northeast Wyoming. So Ben Lepink and uh, John come down here to check it out and found out that there was decent land to homestead. They sent a wire back to a bunch of the other brothers. And um, so Ben Lepink, John, and I believe Joe Jr. met at the train station. They come out and homesteaded and they homesteaded in a checkerboard situation. So they was leaving room for their brothers, sisters and parents to come out here and, and homestead all in one block, which ended up happening. So uh, where I live and, and where my great grandpa's homestead was, George, is probably a mile and a half due east of where Nancy Lee's dad, Mike's homestead was. And their, their parents, Joseph and Francesca, homesteaded just south of here. So Joe Jr., who was the oldest son's homestead is actually where we kind of use as our, our main now we do all of our livestock work in there. And, and so <clears throat> George, I guess was kind of one of the biggest mainstays, uh, you know, Nancy Lee still has Mike's homestead, but um, George bought the rest of them out for the most part, um, Leppings. And I've never pinpointed down exactly where their homestead was. Um, all I know is that it's over there somewhere around Tisdale Divide, so I'm assuming Camino's probably on that now. But outside of that, George and and then my grandpa behind him, Bert, bought the rest of them out as, as, as their homesteads wasn't working out or they decided to go do other things. Um, some of them went to town, worked at the railroad, did different things, but and then and George and Bert bought out other homesteads as well as as times went on, and and George and Bert turned this into eleven thousand acres total. Um, and I guess I get ahead of things a little bit, but um, some interesting things that I learned, kind of researching this whole deal, was. Uh, the majority of them come here in 1960. My great grandpa, George, didn't come here till 17. And I'm assuming it's because the little kids, um, whatever the reason was, but they come in 17 and he loaded uh, 27 head of dairy cows on the train and these three little kids and his wife and come out here and, and claimed his homestead. And then after a year or so, he realized that the dairy cow deal wasn't going to work here. Um, you know, he, he tried to sell cream and he was hauling cream to town with a wagon. And it, it just wasn't, and they did that for years, um, cream and milk and eggs, and but not near so much as, as they could back in Minnesota. So he got rid of all but three or four of his milk cows and bought a hundred head of ewes and, and started with them and started in the sheep business. So it, it kind of at the end of, <clears throat> I believe it was 1966 that uh, George passed away and my grandpa had kind of took, took it over. They was running 2,200 head of sheep on 11,000 acres. Again, I regress a little bit. <clears throat> Interesting thing in, in, in 1916, they all come and things are really good. 
and 17 things were good. And then 1918, things were real dry and they, they couldn't, they'd been planting some crops and, and trying to raise crops enough to, you know, be able to feed their, their milk cows and their chickens and, and the stuff they had. And they, it was kind of a bad drought. And uh, Joe Jr., Joseph Hacker Jr., uh, Ben Lepink, and uh, one of the other boys got on the train. They still owned some land back in, in Hinkley, Minnesota, where they had a bunch of Timothy Hay. And they rode the train back there, and they went back, and they loaded four train car loads of hay by hand. They went back there and cut it with a sigh and, and pitched it on the on the train and then trained it out here so everybody had enough enough hay to feed their livestock through the winter which is uh it's amazing to me um that kind of work ethic i mean there wasn't no stopping those guys so as time went on like i said george and bert kind of my grandpa and great grandpa bought the most of them out, turned the deal over, you know, from George to Bert. And um, my grandpa Bert sold his brother, or older brother, he only had one, Raymond. <clears throat> he was, and I believe, I don't know this for a fact, I believe he got one of the oldest homesteads in Johnson County and when he homesteaded and it was uh, 1936 I believe it was patches of 40s he was at that time and even when when our whole family's homesteaded they could get 320 acres farmstead act and 320 acres homestead act grazing act and so when Raymond turned 18 he could do that but it was there wasn't anything in one whole bunch so he had 40 scattered around and then he traded uh and i believe the small ones were some of them but a bunch of our neighbors he traded till he blocked it up and he had his own little homestead which my uncle james still owns and uh, a couple years and I wish I had my dad's cousin Kay, which was Raymond's oldest daughter. I wish I had her here to tell because she, she actually was here then. Uh, four or five years after he homesteaded that, he lost his leg in a in a ditching accident, and they were they were trying to do some irrigation out of reservoir stuff, and he was ditching with the team and and uh, lost his leg and, and Uncle Raymond ended up, they of course didn't know what the hell to do with him. So they sent him back to, to Minneapolis, kind of where they was from and, and he got rehabbed and, and they built him wooden leg and got him all straightened around and he came back home and, and he's like, well, hell, how, how am I gonna ranch with a wooden leg? So he went back to Minneapolis and he, and he learned to build prosthetics. And he ended up going to Billings shortly after he got trained up. And he he had a very successful prosthetics clinic in Billings. Um, along with, he had a little farm down there on Blue Creek, just south of Billings, and raised some sheep and stuff. But he and his son, Doug, is a, they're, had a really successful prosthetics clinic. My grandpa's sister, Marie, ended up marrying uh, Clyde Key down in KC and they had a trucking business down there. And so my grandpa ended up with this place, uh, which he he ran from, it's, it seems like it's just funny to me. Um, I know George, his dad died in 1966 and, and uh, about 1976, 
he leased a place to my dad and his brother, my uncle James, and and they ran it as a lease deal as partners, and and for a few years till that didn't work, and then they split it. And you know, like I said, it seemed like forever, but it was a ten-year deal. But and uh, my uncle still has his place down just east of us. So. And uh, we have this. My son's here with me. I uh, kind of feel like I'm the fourth generation. You know, if I go from George to my grandpa to my dad to me, but we still own Joseph's deal. Joseph, in uh, 1918, when when things were bad, he went up and bought the Klondike Ranch, which is Tassa's own now, and uh, which is family. Uh, that was my great my great grandpa's youngest sister, Mary, married Leo Tass, and Joseph owned the Klondike, and um, there was a few of the younger brothers involved in that when it was maybe going south. Uh, Leo Tass kind of bought into that. And then, so, uh, you know, Richard Tass is my great grandpa's young sister's son. They, they have that deal. And uh, with that, Joseph still had his original homestead and it went with the Klondike. So my dad and his brother got out of the service in the 60s. Leo Tass, who owned the Klondike at the time and, and owned this stuff over south, then he sold it to my dad and his brother. And that's, that's what kind of started them ranching before they, they were just working for my grandpa. And they bought that section and, and kind of got that started with them. And so we, we still got, I, I guess at the end of the day, I'm, I'm fifth generation. My son who's sitting here behind me K6 generation and I, you know now I got a little grandson hopefully hopefully he'll be the seventh or one of them kids is it uh, it's a real interesting deal I I guess it I I didn't really prepare a whole big deal for this because I can usually just sit and and yammer all this stuff on, and so I didn't prepare it. You know, I'm I'm sitting at the writing desk right now that my grandpa sat at my whole grown up. Um, and uh, right inside the house that my great grandpa built in the twenties, and shortly after they're homesteaded. So we're we're really proud to be here. You know, I know my folks are listening on another computer, and they're proud of the deal. It's, uh, I talked to a neighbor today that uh, is another family that's been here for over a hundred years and there ain't a lot of us left. And, and so we're pretty proud of it. So uh, I know we're supposed to spend 30 minutes, this, whatever. If anybody has any questions, it's uh I, the stories could go on forever when you're when you're just sitting in bed and it's just hard to rattle them all off jennifer you want to come back on yep that's about Thank all i got i no, it's, it's, it's fascinating hearing the parallels between the two Hackert ranches. And um, I've seen the family tree of all of your family. And uh, Nancy Lee shared it with me. And I'm just, I'm fascinated at how pretty much the entire family packed up and all came out West. Um, especially like you said, your descendant came with three young children. Usually at that stage in life, 
you pretty much settled and you don't travel. So I just find it fascinating that they they took this leap of faith and came to Wyoming, and yet the family is here, you know, over a hundred years later, and it, it it's just what's you don't a, get that what surprised me the most that he what surprised me the most he came with twenty one milk cows. The wife and kids kind of got to come, but why the hell would you bring 21 milk cows? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I'm used to back east where I grew up, but out here you don't do dairy cows. <laughs> what were some of the, um, when they diversified and went from the dairy cows, uh, what were some of the, uh, I guess. Uh, well, you know, and here's the deal, and, it, it, and I skip a whole bunch of things. Um, this this is best sheep country. It sure, certainly is. And so when they learned that sheep were the best deal for here, then they built onto the sheep. Um, in 1984, we had a hundred year blizzard, and we my dad lost 1,800 head of sheep. And you know about something. The only thing he didn't think him is he didn't owe any money against the land. Um, so then he started building back up. We had very few sheep left. We had a small bunch of cows, and at that point we kind of turned into just running cows. And it, it was easier because it's easier to produce water, and that's kind of why the sheep thing was so big. Is they didn't need so much water, and if you're going by, you know years ago they built some reservoir stuff but there wasn't electricity there wasn't a way to produce water so you're going on natural water and we don't have no creek running through this sun again so um so at that point we kind of turned over and and it's hard to protect ourselves from predators with sheep um you know johnson county has changed as a whole it, it was a huge sheep producer for years and years. And when it got to where it was hard to protect ourselves from predators and, um, and, and of course markets changed, but um, so now we predominantly run cattle. Uh, we, we run a, still have 150 head of sheep. And um, I guess I think my dad's always felt like you're not a complete man unless you have a little bunch of sheep and, and I don't disagree with that. Um, so we'll we'll probably always have a little bunch of sheep. Just because they they built the thing, you know, and um, so you know it's it's interesting. And I remember as a kid, and I and I fortunately and and I'm I, I just kind of babbling here a little bit. You know, I grew up and I'm pointing 50 foot that away is my parents' house. And that's where I grew up. And this was my grandparents' house. So, you know, I grew up here. And uh, so I got to spend way more time with, with my grandparents than any of my cousins or, well, of course my sister was here too, but any of my cousins, they never really got to spend the time with with my grandpa like I did and, and kind of my grandpa was a quiet guy so he didn't really tell you know if you really ask him he'd tell you but he didn't really tell a lot of stuff but he's but his older brother Raymond when he come down and he was the one that has the prosthetics clinic that had one of the last homesteads here he'd tell all kinds of stories and that's where I learned a lot of stuff from him um, but when I asked my grandpa you know, he, he tells stuff, but um, one time I asked him, I said, why, why did everybody move out here? And he said, and, and that day we sit right here at this table over here where my son's sitting and we're looking out the picture window and it's snowing sideways. I mean, it's a dirty, cold son of a gun and the winds are blowing. And he said, well, apparently they want to get away from bad winters. And I I think about that all the time. I say, God bless. Winters must have been damn bad back there. Cause... But he used to tell me, oh, Grandpa would tell me, he said, you know, Wyoming well, winters ain't bad. It's in springs or a bitch, though. And um, that's kind of how we are. So 
it's uh, I mean, it's it's almost a little bit emotional for me to even talk about this stuff and be able to get to grow up here and take this deal over. Um, There's something special about having that family and not like not just the memories, but like the tangible, like living in your grandparents' house. Do you guys have like any other original buildings from your from the homestead years? Yeah, you know, one of the one one of the things I'm proudest of, and I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. We got a building right out here west of the house, we call the wash house. And and I hope Nancy Lee's listening. She and she knows. Um and and part of I know what she talked about is going to, to the country school. The hacker school sits right here west of my house. Just right next to it. And and once they were done using the school, my great grandpa drug that it's on skids and they they turned it into kind of storage and then they had the old gas powered washing machine out there where grandmother washed her clothes out there. And then once that went away and they got the bathroom built onto the house and put the washer and dryer in there and stuff. And then grandma and grandpa had their freezers and um, those still sitting there, but the hacker school sits right here next to the house. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and they, it was on skid, so they drug it around depending on, cause there was, there was a bunch of them. So they kind of drug it around where it's closest for everybody to go to it. And I don't know that there was ever more than two or three went in it at a time maybe four, um, but that's a, the schoolhouse that, that Nancy Lee Beatty went to till about third grade. And then Joseph bought, bought the land and it's right across from what everybody knows now is the old truck stop, the zip trip now. Um, and Nancy lives across there, but Joseph bought that chunk of land and he built the house and like, my cousin David lived in now and ended up being his his folks, Bill and Millard, um, and and JD and Yulela Elsom, which you know Yulela was a, was a sister to to Nancy and and uh, then their mom lived in the a little house up front where actually Michelle Duncan lives in now. Um, th that was kind of a hacker compound for lack of a better term but joseph had bought that and and built the big house there which which my uncle bill which was my grandpa's uncle bill and and i he was still bill miller was still alive when i was a kid hell i knew him um oh bill he those after joseph had started the clon or bought the klondike and then they kind of turned into a dude ranch deal and Bill was kind of in the horse trading deal. He bought a Shetland pony out here one time. I was probably five, six years old. And he told my grandpa, he said, hell, them, them kids, they need they need a pony. And he said, they don't need no pony. Yeah, everybody bought him a pony. And that son of a gun had feet on him that long. Mm -hmm. I bet he was 20 years old. He'd never been touched. And us kids, we jacked with him some, and he, you, hell, you couldn't hardly get close to him. He'd bite you and paw you, and, and Grandpa hauled him off. But they, uh, it's, uh, it's really kind of interesting, I guess. You know, when I was in high school, we didn't really, couldn't get a date in Buffalo because you was related to everybody's we had to go to Sheridan and find somebody to take to the movies and make sure it wasn't your cousin. <laughs> when your well, great grandpa had, had 12 brothers and sisters and they all come here together. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the brand for the George Hackert Ranch? Because Well, George, George's brand of my uncle, my uncle James has his brand and it was it's called a lazy GH. They call it a lazy GH, and it's actually what I'd call a drunken GH. So the G lays down. And then the H. And then when my granddad married my grandmother, he got his own brand. And up till then, uh, they ran everything in commune on um, just under under George's brand. And it's the Lazy GH. And 
which my Uncle James has and still uses now. And then once my grandpa got married and then they were going to start separating sheep, he got a brand and it's a B plus, um, which is my brand now, and um, which my grandpa handed to my dad and then my dad had already had a brand, so he handed it to me. Um, so my Uncle James uses George Hacker's brand and I use Bert Hacker's brand. Um, George's brand was, in the, and I did the research on it, it he, he started it in 1919 when it, when it got legal through the uh, livestock board. Mm -hmm. And then my grandpa's, the, the B plus was, was in, uh, I believe in, in 39. 38 or 39. Mm -hmm. So when did electricity actually make it to the ranch? <laughs> well, that'd be a better question from my dad. Uh, they, they had gas lights for a little bit. Uh, and I believe it was about 1966 or seven before they actually had rural electrification. But a little bit before then, they had gas lights. And, and down here in the basement, if you come down here, I can show you, the pipes are still in the basement um, where the gas run to run the lights. Uh, we, we have a concrete building just out here west of the house that at one point housed the engines that ran the electricity. And then once they got REA, Grandpa gutted that and he turned it into a smokehouse. And we, we smoked meat in there for years. And it, you know, it's certainly still usable to, to smoke meat. We, we just don't much anymore, but. Um, well, you gotta I, use, I believe you it gotta was reuse, right? 65 or six. And I'm sure my dad, my dad's over there 50 feet away. I'm sure he's screaming the year and I can't hear him. So. <laughs> so, somewhere in there is when they actually got live power run through the through the lines mm -hmm. and uh, it was it was in the 50s before they had and and he likes to argue with me too when they tell him when they got running water and he said no we had running water before that because it ran down the hill uh but it was somewhere in the 50s when they got actually running water uh, there's a hand dug well behind the house here, and and of course at, at Uncle Joe's over there there's a hand dug well, and and at Aunt Kate's up up west there's a hand dug well that we obviously don't use anymore, and they're you know they're 25 or 30 feet just what they hand dug. And I actually that's why I should have had the PowerPoint deal because I have a picture of of uh, George and and one of his hired men, and they had a tent deal set up with some canvas stuff where. They was actually digging. There was a picture of them digging the the well back here. Mm -hmm. You know, just digging it by hand. Uh, so they got a windmill set up at some point. I don't know exactly when. Mm -hmm. um, and and they had it piped down to where there was a just a hand pump thing on the sink. And my dad likes to call that that was running water. But it was in the 50s before they actually had running water and actually built the bathroom all to the house mm -hmm. um, where, where they had a, a toilet and a bathtub and all that. So was, just like was me and Philly and Taylor, we had outhouses? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the outhouse that was here for that, there was actually two here what the closest one of the house that I mean we used it if you was in the crowd as closest you go to it up till whole oh, hell the mid mid 80s it was getting dilapidated and we tore it down and and uh one we had up alongside the crowd that was kind of for the crowd used my uncle James actually moved it down when my dad and his brother split and he's kept it up. He still has it next to his grill. It's, you know, it's usable and it, it's more of a something to look at. He keeps it painted up. And, but it's uh, his house is quite a little bit farther away from the grill than ours. Uh, those, are, 
those are wonderful stories. Um, I don't see any questions coming in from the audience that haven't already been answered. Any other quick stories you want to share with us before I invite all of the rest of our speakers back for a wrap up? No, I'm good. I'm good. All good right. Job. And I appreciate it. I thank you and I thank the museum for doing this deal. And, um, we're, we're certainly proud of it. And we appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. That's wonderful. I, you know, and I think this is such a pivotal program that is run by the Wyoming State Historical Preservation Office. Um, you know, there's, it's so hard, especially from what the many years uh, I've worked here at the museum and, you know, reading all of these histories and realizing it's quite a feat to not only proof up a homestead, especially because you had to pick the right five years to homestead, but then to sustain it and rejuvenate it and keep it in the family for over a hundred years. I just, I think that's marvelous that we have as many centennial ranches in this county as is listed. And uh, you three, I understand are the most recent, although, wait, no, the Tass Ranch is just, just got um, centennial award from what I remember. It is. I think they're a year it is. behind you, correct? They got they got it in 2020 because that's when Joseph bought it was in 1920. Wonderful. And, um, and, well, I, and I know Richard's looking forward to be able to showcase that deal. They're they're proud of that thing, um, for sure. Oh yes, definitely. So uh, Taylor and uh, Nancy Lee and Tammy, if you're there, let's turn our cameras on. I just want to do a, a quick wrap up. I just want to say on behalf of the museum, we're just so excited that we were able to present this conference and share this history. You know, it's, it's fascinating because this is our third time celebrating our Centennial Ranches. Last time we did this was about six or seven years ago when we celebrated the Mikey Ranch, the, um, Cash Karuchit Ranch, the Foster Ranch. Um, who else am I missing? The Rams Bottom Ranch. You know, and... I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you one quick story. All right. When you say Mikey Ranch, I was on the conservation district board out of Campbell County for some years, and Pete O. Mikey was was on the Powder River Conservation District Board. And I I kind of known him as a kid, you know, but he's an old guy. And uh, we were at a conference in Gillette, Wyoming. And he said, who are you? I said, I'm Travis Hacker. And he said, you related to Eulalia Hacker? I said, well, yeah, she is my grandpa's cousin. And, and the, this is for Nancy, actually. He said, you know, she was my school teacher. <laughs> and, and she actually married a tailor down at Sussex and so she took a school teaching job down there. And I don't know if Nancy can hear me, but she, but he's in, in hell. Tita was 75 or 80 at the time. So, well, she's my school teacher. So, yeah, but, but the family don't fork near as much as you'd think it would in Johnson County. Mm -hmm. Well, I, again, I want to thank all of our attendees for attending our first virtual conference. I'm glad that it went as seamlessly as it did. Uh, again, I just am so thankful that we get to celebrate this history. And I'm thankful that you guys took the time to share these memories, the story and this history, because, you know, it's so funny. Everyone loves celebrating our agricultural history and our ranching history. But it's funny, you aren't the only speakers where I've reached out to them and they're kind of like, who would be interested in our history? Like, you know, are they really gonna find this fascinating? And I just remember when Marsha Christian, I think she was one of our first ranches we celebrated. She was talking about how her, I think her grandfather uh, was establishing the first ditch in that area where their ranch was. And they, it took like two years to put the ditch in and then there was a sudden flash flood the following year and it completely destroyed all of their work. And so they had to redo the ditch from scratch at the very beginning. And she's sharing the story and I'm looking at the audience members and they're all like, 
Yep. We know that we've been there. We commiserate, <laughs> you know, so I'm just so excited that we, um, you all shared this story. Thank you so much. I'm going to give everyone an applause because the rest of the people are hidden. And uh, I thank you for coming out this evening. And uh, uh, on behalf of the Jim Gatch Memorial Museum, again, thank you for your support. So bye, everyone. Thank you.